Well, good morning. Uh, we're glad to have you with us today. We are live here at uh, the 10 a.m. service, and uh, next week we are getting ready uh, to have our in-person gatherings for, the, for, for everybody. Um, and so that online registration starts tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, it's good for you to pre-register, and we're asking that you would please pre-register so that we can be ready for you. We do have a limit on the capacity uh, here in this room. We also want to make sure that we have an accurate um, accounting for everyone who is here, uh, just for um, safety and, and uh, liability purposes, and so that will be helpful. If you want to register uh, tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m. and throughout the week, you just go to gracekutztown.org uh, slash register, and you can do it that way, or you can call the church office between 9 a.m. and 12 noon, uh, Monday through Thursday, and register that way as well. Now, if you have children, uh, we would love for you to join us uh, at gracekutztown.online.church. Uh, uh, at 1115 for Grow Elementary Online, and then noon for Grow Pre-K Online. And then elementary kids are going to Zoom with their small group leaders at 1230 today. You'll have to go uh, to the Grow Elementary Online experience to be able to get the uh, necessary password uh, for that. Again, we want to always have the safest environments as possible. Then also, this coming Wednesday, our youth group is gathering. It's because we will be having our coming uh, sixth graders, uh, joining the rest of the group and on Wednesday night. Um, uh, you're encouraged to make sure that you're on our mailing list, and if you want to get on that, uh, the email list, you just need to just send an email to uh, office at gracekutztown.org, and we can get you hooked up with that. But it is a joy to be together uh, today, either for those who are uh, here in person or for those of you who are uh, joining online. Um, we've come to set our mind's attention and our heart's affection on who Jesus is, that we get to participate together in the highest expression that human beings are capable of participating in, and that is the act of worship. And so our worship team is going to lead us in some singing and help us focus our hearts and minds on Jesus. But I want to remind us who we're worshiping this morning. It's Jesus, God's own Son, Jesus, our overcoming Savior, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, the lover of our souls, Jesus, the mender of our broken hearts. It's Jesus, the rock that we put our hope in. And so let's worship him together. Good morning. We're so glad you're joining us today. Please stand and worship that Jesus that we speak of and um, be loud, be proud, and be happy.
pray together. Uh, Lord, as we just sang, as we worship, uh, as we open your word, we, we come face to face with, with love himself. But God, you have uh, told us in your word that you are love. As Father, as Son, as Spirit, uh, Lord, today we celebrate uh, not just your love, but your goodness and your grace Lord, how it's been made visible through your son, Jesus, by his death, by his resurrection. How it's been made available to us by nothing that, that we could do to earn it. But Lord, a gift of your grace. And Lord, our prayer today is that your Holy Spirit would do a transforming work in our hearts, a redemptive work in our hearts. Lord, that as we open your word, Lord, that we'd hear you speaking through it. Lord, our prayer today echoes the prayer of the Apostle Paul as he prayed for the Christians who were living in Ephesus. Lord, that, that as, as, as we are rooted and established in your love for us, Lord, help us together to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is, is Jesus' love. Lord, help us to know that love that surpasses knowledge with the goal of being filled to the whole measure of all of your fullness. Lord, do a work in us and through us for your glory and yours alone as we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
Well, friends, today is the, the last day of our Love is Sermon series. And so if you have your Bible uh, with you there at home or you want to uh, follow along, uh, be sure to uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. In the series, we've been ans- asking and then answering that question. So how do we become people whose lives, whose relationships, even whose interactions are marked by love? And when we read through this definition of of what love is, as we think about how Jesus has demonstrated it for us through the cross and through the empty grave, we, in a lot of ways, see how our love doesn't always mirror very well this love that we read right here. But as we've been doing all throughout the series, we're going to have it read for us. And to help bridge the gap between those who were going to be uh, worshiping with us at home and those who were going to be worshiping with us here in person, we'll have a guest scripture reader uh, every week, and this week our scripture reader is Jim Evans. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Maybe you're like me when you hear these these words it's not always that my name could be substituted for love in this passage adam is not always patient adam is not always kind i would imagine for you no matter how long you've been following jesus you are in the same situation and something i I said last week that i think is so important for us to remember is this passage is not a moralistic checklist that that can make us feel good about ourselves for the the parts of the passage that we can check off. It's also not a a hopeless kind of a passage to make us uh, feel those those pangs of despair about how bad we are because we can't measure up and we have no hope whatsoever of ever attaining to this. What this list does, what this description of love does, what these 15 facets of, of love do for us is they propel us toward Jesus, toward the one who makes loving like this possible. The kind of love described here, that word agape love, agape in the original Greek is, is the love that God has demonstrated to us first through the gospel, the sending of God's one and only son to this earth to live a perfect life and to die our death in our place. Imperfect, sinful people as we are. The good news of Jesus who rose again from the dead in victory so that we can have victory over our sin and our death as well. That this is the love that followers of Jesus are enabled to experience, but then this is the love that we as followers of Jesus are equipped to exhibit in all of our relationships, the good and the not so good, the easy and like the last furthest thing there is from easy. See, we can't do this on our own. We need to experience the abiding love of Jesus first. And that's the story of of the scriptures. This is the story that God tells from cover to cover, from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the last book of the Bible, uh, Revelation, that God has created humanity. He he created humanity to live a perfect connection and perfect fellowship and in a perfect relationship with, with him. But what had happened was the first human beings, Adam and Eve, had chosen their own way. They thought that they knew better. They thought that they could find their satisfaction or their hope in in another place that caused sin and death to enter the world. Now the entire world has been fraught with brokenness that comes in a myriad of forms. It touches not just our world, but our very lives, yours and mine. The fact that that, that here we are dealing with a pandemic is just one evidence that this world is broken. There is something that is not quite right in this world. But we see it in our own lives. We see it in our own struggles. 
we see it in some of the own feelings in our hearts, to some, even in some of the, the inclinations of our minds. And yet the scriptures tell us, the story of God tells us that he called out a people for his own who would worship him as the one true God. And even then they struggled with, with, with uh, keeping the main thing the main thing, keeping their eyes fixed on him. They would head in their own direction and God in his mercy would meet them again and again in that battle until one day God sent his one and only son into the world, fully God and fully human. Jesus, who would live his life perfectly to attain to perfection, a level that we could never attain to. Jesus, who would go to a cross to die a horrific, unimaginable death, but the death that we actually deserve because of our own rebellion against God, because of our own sins. Jesus absorbed that penalty. Jesus absorbed that death. Jesus absorbed God's wrath for us so that we could experience freedom freedom from our sin, freedom from our death, and really freedom from ourselves as well. And our own inclinations and our own desires that are far less than what God wants for us. Jesus would rise three days later to, de- to show that he defeated death. Jesus would even ascend into heaven where right now at this very moment, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, he is in heaven reigning with God the Father. And the story of the scriptures also gives us hope for the future, reminding us that one day Jesus is going to return and he is going to restore all of creation. But at the center of the whole story, the center of the gospel, the center of the good news is that through our faith in Jesus, we're actually adopted into God's family. Through our faith in Jesus alone, not because of anything we could do, not by being religious enough or good enough or or generous enough, we can actually experience a change of heart that then leads to a change of life, a change of heart that leads to a change of love, that God loves us just the way we are, but through our faith in Jesus, he, he doesn't leave us where we are. We grow to look more and more and more like Jesus. But that only happens when we place all of our faith, our, our, our trust, our weight on Jesus and what he accomplished for us. And maybe today's the day where you need to commit your life to Jesus because maybe you've been trusting in religion or, or religious activity or trying to be a good person or a better person or in, in trying to be a more loving person in your own strength and you've never placed your faith in, in Jesus depending on him for your salvation and on him to fill you and to fuel you for that better life that he makes so clear uh, throughout 1 Corinthians chapter 13. See, this is where, where love starts. If you haven't experienced this, um, I pray that you will. But for those of us who believe the good news of the gospel, for those of us who placed our faith in Jesus, there are these parts of our hearts that are still struggling with loving this way. There are parts of our hearts where where we're not always loving in a way that is patient with one another. There we, we sometimes love in a way in a counterfeit kind of a, with a counterfeit kind of a love where we keep a record of wrongs or we're, we're, we're easily angered. What do we do with that? The answer is by resting in the good news of Jesus, that this is what helps us to love in a new way, that, that every relationship can be challenging at times, but it's the good news of the gospel that we come back to again and again and again that propels us to love in the way that the Apostle Paul describes. And we've talked about some hard-hitting teaching uh, from Scripture on on the love that our faith in Jesus enables us to exhibit. It's been convicting at times. And at the end of the passage here, in verse 7, it's it's equally as convicting. And what I want to do this morning is for a little while drill down on, on these four different aspects of love and, and, and talk about what that might mean for us as followers of Jesus and how it reorients us again and again and again to the good news of the gospel. The Apostle Paul says in the close of the passage that love always protects. In some translations, maybe you memorize this in another translation, perhaps like the King James Version that says love bears all things. And so what does that mean for love to bear all things? What does it mean that love always protects, that word protect in the original Greek language when the Apostle Paul was penning these words meant to to cover kind of like it would be translated in other places uh, in that very way to describe a roof. It's a form of, of, of protection 
That roof would bear all things, to borrow from that other translation. This past week, uh, a week ago today, and then at various times throughout the week again, you, like me, were probably grateful for that roof of protection over you and, and your family, over your home, protecting you and your family from what would be damaging. That's the essence of what the Apostle Paul is describing here when he says that love always protects. The Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, the Apostle Peter later will write in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, that this, this love that we experience through Jesus, we are able to exhibit to others in that love covers over a multitude of sins. It's a love that, that is, is, is foretold in some small way by a story in the life of Noah in the Old Testament where, where, where Noah kind of goes out and, and uh, I'll give you the Adam Roberts translation of, of Genesis chapter 9. Noah goes out and, and, and parties all night and uh, it doesn't seem like he really at the end of it all knows where he is or what's been happening. He's kind of like passed out. And his, two of his sons come and they, they cover over their dad to preserve his dignity, to, to cover over his shame. This is, I think, what the Apostle Paul is getting to in chapter 13 when he says that love always protects or love bears all things. Our love protects the dignity of those around us. Our love uh, toward others protects them from shame. Our love for others protects from needlessly exposing their faults and their failures. Our love protects the reputations of, of others. And that's really challenging because there's this human part of us that when we're wronged or we're offended, um, we don't really want to protect. We want to gossip or slander or, or damage that other person in some way. And yet when someone fails us or someone disappoints us, when there's a gap between what we expect of the person and our experience with that person, we have an opportunity to put something in the center. And what is that thing going to be? Uh, I heard a famous preacher talk about that. And this would be an instance here where we fill in that gap with a protective kind of love that mirrors the protective love that Jesus has shown us. That instead of... of, of of pouring on the shame that we think they did. Gossiping or slandering, we cover over, we forgive just as in Christ God forgave us to borrow from later on in the New Testament. We remember that God has protected us from our sin and our shame through our faith in Jesus. And when we struggle, we tell the good news of Jesus to ourselves. We repeat the gospel to ourselves. We depend on the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. We beg God to change our hearts. We lean into the Holy Spirit's work, his power, his presence. And when we're tempted to talk about the other person to anybody, the one we go to is God. Love always protects. And then there's even more because the Apostle Paul goes on to describe how love always trusts. And maybe you're like me, you read that and you think, what does that look like exactly? Because there's times in our relationships where we want to do anything but trust. In fact, some who are with us today have dealt with circumstances in relationships that have been extremely difficult. There's tremendous hurt, even to the point of abuse. And what do we do with that? Does this mean that we just blindly trust every single relationship in every single instance? How do we navigate this difficulty, and I'm here to tell you that we always interpret scripture with scripture. That it becomes dangerous if we just kind of like hunt and, and pull out verse here and a verse there and don't really uh, think about it in the context of the greater message that God sends throughout his word and what he communicates elsewhere. That these are some of the hardest places of, of relationships. And I thought about that the nature of forgiveness versus the nature of trust and how those are two very different things. Matthew chapter 18, one of the, I would call them flagship passages as it relates to, to issues in our relationships and how to navigate them, I think is very helpful. One in that Matthew 18 tells the story of the unmerciful servant who, where, where it reminds us that, that we are uh, called to um, exhibit that same level of love and grace that we've experienced ourselves. But then also... In Matthew 18, 
kind of the how-to of how to deal with those issues in relationships when the people around us sin against us. That the, the step number one is going directly to the person and, and, and sharing our heart with them. And then step two is taking that witness with us. If, if first they're it's, 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 um, if, if at first we're rebuffed and then, you know, step three is to, to take it even a step further. Um, but the goal in step one and the goal of step two and the goal of step three, we find out in Matthew 18 is, rec- is, is, um, repentance. It's that person to humbly admit that, that, that they've sinned and for there to be restoration. So the, the goal of step one, going to the person directly is always to give them an opportunity to repent an opportunity to then have that trust restored. And that's step two. If, it, if it's not done at step one, then the goal there is repentance and restoration. And if not in step two, then it has to go to step three. And the goal there is re- repentance and restoration. Again, the goal is always repentance. It's, it's a desire for trust to be rebuilt. But forgiveness and trust are, are so very different. We're called to forgive, but sometimes that, that work of rebuilding trust is very difficult. I think repentance is a good a benchmark that helps us to rebuild some of that trust. By our human nature, though, we, we kind of just want to write people off. We don't ever even want to give them a chance at level one of Matthew 18. Sometimes our goal in confrontation isn't restoration and isn't repentance. It reveals something else in our own hearts. It's no easy task to rebuild trust in a relationship, but in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus, we have all the hope and help we need. The beauty of the gospel is that because of our faith in Jesus alone, we get to do this for the other people around us the ones who are easy to love and the ones that are hard to love, when people sin against us and they demonstrate repentance, a a willingness to own their sin and turn away from it, like we get to show grace. We get to show them Jesus through this. We get to point one another through his forgiving work on the cross, his miraculous work of redemption that comes through his resurrection. We get to point them to the one who loves us relentlessly, the one who cares for us compassionately. That's an opportunity that we get to show someone with a repentant heart. The question for all of us is, how do we respond to people when they demonstrate that repentance around us? Do we allow people to rebuild that trust as they demonstrate that repentance? Do we assume positively of of people, give them the benefit of the doubt? Or do we sometimes fall in that trap of jumping to conclusions or assuming motives or believing the worst about someone before we hear the whole story, maybe even before we have an opportunity to talk to them uh, one-on-one. And here's the convicting question. Do we generally see people through the lenses of the gospel, or do we tend to see people through the lenses of our own grievances with them? And herein is sometimes the issue in our own hearts that prevents us from loving in a way that always trusts. The answer here is always back to the gospel, though. As a follower of Jesus, it's to to run to the cross, to look intently at Jesus, to seek the Holy Spirit's work in transforming our hearts, because we can't do this on our own. We need his help. We need his power. We need his strength. We need his grace. But we also need that in what the Apostle Paul also says in the same section of Scripture, because he says that love always hopes, that there's an undeniable hopefulness In how we love one another as followers of Jesus, we hope for God to do a restorative work. We hope for the best in our relationships. We hope for God to do a work of redemption when things go wrong. See, we can love in a way that that hopes in all things because our hope is deeply rooted in something that we haven't done, but something that only Jesus has done, the work of a good God, a merciful God, a loving Savior who died in our place. Our our love isn't rooted in how we feel. Our love isn't rooted in how we want to respond. Our love is rooted in the gospel, God's redemptive work that he chooses to do through his son, Jesus. And if God can take something as horrific and brutal and vile and ugly as the cross and bring about a resurrection and redemption, he can easily take our brokenness 
and bring about a beautiful work of resurrection and redemption as well. Friends, this is hope. And yet for me, I'll just speak for me personally, I look around at the world, I look at my own life, I look at, at I, I watch the news, or I'll, I'll, I'll read a, a newspaper, or I'll scroll a social media feed, or I'll listen to conversations going on around me in the grocery store, although I guess let's face it, most people aren't having conversations in the grocery store anymore. We're just in and out and maintaining our six-foot distance and, and all that goes with it. Um, but it seems to me that there's so much cynicism in our society, so much cynicism in our conversations as it relates to the world. But even as Christians, there's so much cynicism as we relate to the world around us. There's so much cynicism as we relate even to one another. And the great enemy of, of hope is cynicism. Sometimes we're, we're just so guilty of living hopelessly as followers of Jesus. And yet we're enabled through the good news of the gospel to have hopeful and humble hearts. But the gospel actually helps us to stay humble. The gospel helps us to stay hopeful. And the soul-searching question I need to come back to again and again and again that I offer you today as well because I believe that God wants to do a work in my heart and your heart, is have we lost sight of God's ability to change the hearts of people? Have we lost sight of the ability of, of God to change the attitudes of people? Have we lost sight of God's ability to change the behavior of people? Do we behave and do we believe as though God still changes people to look like Jesus? And he still can change me and still can change you. Have we crept into a spirit of cynicism or even criticism? And if we have, the only way to get it right is to turn from it, to confess it as God, to confess it to God for what it is, and then to remind ourselves of the gospel, to remind ourselves of God's ability to change our hearts, to ask God to change and transform the way we see the people around us and the way we perceive the people around us. It's easy to have a cynical spirit, especially in the midst of what we're, we're, we're witnessing in our world today with the pandemic at hand. It's easy to have a cynical kind of a spirit when, when we are out of touch and disconnected from one another. But the gospel enables us to have a humble and hopeful spirit. But then notice how the passage ends. The Apostle Paul sums it all up so perfectly when he says that love always perseveres. In other words, love pushes through. Love keeps on loving even when it's hard. Love keeps on loving even when we want to quit. Love keeps on loving even when there are, are, are issues that need to be forgiven. Maybe you have a situation that comes to mind where it's just really difficult to, to love. And what's the answer? It's the same answer to all these things. It's the same answer to every part of what it means to live our lives for the honor that's to look to us, not to ourselves. It's to remember the words of Hebrews chapter 12, words that I've had to remind myself of over and over again, especially uh, in, the, in the midst of the last few months. And, and I've reminded us of them in various ways, whether it's through the, the preaching on a Sunday morning or uh, the times that, that I've been connecting um, uh, with uh, the, the, the lunch chats or the, the coffee talks on, online. It's the words of Hebrews chapter 12 that remind us of this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that is those who came before us in the faith, those who are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, then let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do that? The writer of Hebrews tells us, verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. How did he do it, you ask? It says here, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then we're reminded in verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. How do we we guard against wanting to quit? How do we, we guard against uh, uh, pulling away rather than leaning in? It's to consider Jesus and how he endured his own issues with the sins of others. 
Look to Jesus. Throughout the series, I've been encouraged personally as I've, I've spent time in this particular passage. And throughout the series, I've been deeply convicted in a variety of ways. As I've come face to face with the passage and then face to face with who I am and where I'm at. The beauty of God's word is that God continues to speak through it and speaks to us, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. He speaks through his Holy Spirit. He applies that truth to our hearts. I was doing some reading online recently and I, I found a, a fantastic um, summation of what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in a writing from uh, pastor and author Paul Tripp. It's from his book, What Did You Expect? It really focuses on, on marriage, but in the, the way he shared this online, it, it really can be applied to any relationship, not just marriage. Again, these words flow out of the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to share them with you this morning uh, because I found them so helpful. He describes these 23 different uh, facets of, of love. Love is being willing to have your life complicated by the needs and struggles of others without impatience or anger. You can hear 1 Corinthians 13 in that, I'm sure. Love is actively fighting the temptation to be critical and judgmental toward another while looking for ways to encourage and praise. Love is making a daily commitment to resist the needless moments of conflict that come from pointing out and responding to minor offenses. Love is being lovingly honest and humbly approachable in times of misunderstanding. Love is being more committed to unity and understanding than you are to winning, accusing, or being right. Love is making a daily commitment to admit your sin, weakness, and failure, and to resist the temptation to offer an excuse or shift the blame. Love is being willing, when confronted by another, to examine your heart rather than rising to your defense and shifting the focus. Love is making a daily commitment to grow in love so that the love you offer to another is increasingly selfish and mature. And patient. Love is being unwilling to do what is wrong when you have been wronged, but looking for concrete and specific ways to overcome evil with good. Love is being a good student of another, looking for their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs so that in some way you can remove the burden, support them as they carry it, or encourage them along the way. Love is being willing to invest the time necessary to discuss, examine, and understand the relational problems you face. Staying on task until the problem is removed or you have agreed upon a strategy of response. Love is being willing to always ask for forgiveness and always being committed to grant forgiveness when it is requested. Love is recognizing the high value of trust in a relationship and being faithful to your promises and true to your word. Love is speaking kindly and gently even in moments of disagreement, refusing to attack the other person's character or assault their intelligence. Love is being unwilling to flatter, lie, manipulate, or deceive in any way in order to co-opt the other person into giving you what you want or doing something your way. Love is being unwilling to ask another person to be the source of your identity, meaning, and purpose, or inner sense of well-being while refusing to be the source of theirs. Love is the willingness to have less free time, less sleep, and a busier schedule in order, in order to be faithful to what God has called you to be and do as a spouse, parent, neighbor etc. Love is a commitment to say no to selfish instincts and to do everything that is within your ability to promote real unity, functional understanding, and active love in your relationships. Love is staying faithful to your commitment to treat another with appreciation, respect, and grace, even in moments when the other person doesn't seem to deserve it or is unwilling to reciprocate it. Love is the willingness to make regular and costly sacrifices for the sake of a relationship without asking for anything in return or using your sacrifices to place the other person in your debt. Love is being unwilling to make any personal decision or choice that would harm a relationship, hurt the other person, or weaken the bond of trust between you. Love is refusing to be self-focused or demanding, but instead looking for specific ways to serve, support, and encourage even when you are busy or tired. And then lastly, love is daily admitting to yourself, the other person, and God, that you are unable to be driven by a cruciform love without God's protecting, providing, forgiving, rescuing, and delivering grace. 
Friends, what 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7 does in us is it reminds us that we cannot do this on our own. That we cannot do this in our own power. We cannot muster up enough good feelings or right intentions for this. We need the gospel. We need Jesus. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this. And my prayer for us is that Jesus' love for us would rule and reign in our hearts in such a way that it would fill us to the level where we can love in that same way the people around us, the good and the difficult ones, in that way that Jesus has loved us first. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, uh, we confess our need for you. You to change our hearts. You, God, to reorient us toward love itself. Jesus, your one and only Son. Lord, we confess that we can't do this in our own strength. We need your Holy Spirit's power to bring this evidence out of us, this fruit out of us, what you placed in us through our faith in Jesus alone. Lord, today we confess that, that, that our love does not always protect. We don't always have the best interests of, of, of those around us at heart. So often it's easy for us to, to love in a self-protective kind of way rather than an other's protective kind of way. There are times, Lord, where we willingly and knowingly pile on sin and shame on the people around us. There are times when we damage the reputations of those around us. There are times when, when we would rather gossip or slander. We confess that God today as sin. Lord, we confess our, our, our lack of love and our unwillingness to trust. There are times when the people around us uh, are repentant and, 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 and own their sin and desire to change. And still, God, we withhold our forgiveness. We're unwilling to allow the rebuilding of trust, slow as it may be, we're unwilling for it to happen. Lord, we confess that we're not always that hopeful and humble in our relationships. We confess, God, that it's easy for us at times to be cynical. We confess, Lord, that it's easy for us at times to to quit on relationships, to, to pull away rather than lean in. It's easy for us to assume the worst rather than believe the best. Sometimes there's an unwillingness on our part to do the hard work in following the, the very clear prescription of Scripture of going to that person and speaking one-on-one -on -one in love with the hope of repentance on the other side. Again, God, we need the good news of the gospel to transform us, not just to save us from our sin, although, Lord, I pray for those who maybe have never experienced the salvation that comes by placing their faith in Jesus alone. But, Lord, the gospel is something we never move away from as followers of Jesus. That it's not just the source of our, our salvation, it's also the source of our sanctification. God, remind us of, of who you are and who we are in light of that. Remind us of, of the, the grace and the mercy that, that's been made available to us for the power of your Holy Spirit who's at work in transforming us from glory into glory. Or do a, a transforming work today in our hearts, do a redemptive work in our relationships. And may it be, Lord, for your glory and yours alone as we pray this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Since today was the last Sunday of our Love Is series, we're going to finish the passage in 1 Corinthians 13. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love.
Friends, completeness is coming. Um, for those of us who's, who have trusted Christ as our Savior, we will see him and experience his love face to face. Um, but as we wait, we have the privilege of running to him and resting in his embrace. And we're going to sing about that together in our last song. So please join us in singing.
Father, we recognize today that there is no other name under heaven given to us by which we can be saved. That Jesus is the source of salvation. Jesus is the source of all that is good. Or draw us back to yourself again and again and again. Or give us hearts that are or oriented toward your love and grace. Give us hearts that are dependent on your Holy Spirit's power to do in us, through us, what we cannot do on our own. Or continue to fill us with the hope that we have through the goodness of the gospel. And Lord, may that propel us deeper and deeper into who you are as Father, Son, and Spirit. Lord, as we head into the week ahead, we look forward to how we will see you at work. Give us eyes to see you. Give us eyes, Lord, to hear you speaking. Um, Lord, give us opportunities as we, we open your word day in and day out to be reminded of who you are and how much we need you. Lord, be glorified through the lives we live. We pray in Jesus' matchless name. So God bless you.